I'm going to start with a confession that I am not a runner. Any runners in the audience? How many runners have we got? A fair few. Excellent. Okay, the reason I'm not a runner is I have freakishly long arms. And the reason I have freakishly long arms is thanks to these two characters. So this is my parents... And that is them getting married after they had both represented Great Britain at the Moscow 1980 Olympics for rowing. So I am the spawn of Olympians. <laughs> specimen of all specimens. Now, you can imagine, growing up in that kind of environment, life was never really dull, and I did every single sport under the sun. I was doing judo, trampolining, netball, athletics. And I was actually quite good at football. But back in the day, we're talking this is the 90s, and back in the 90s, there was no girls' football team, so I actually had to play in the primary boys' football league. And it was those glory days. I don't know if you can remember, ladies. Do you remember those days when you used to grow your hair all the way down to your bottom? Do you remember those days? Well, before I played a football match, I would put my hair, my, my bottom-length long hair, in this neat little plait, and I'd run to the pitch really excited. And without fail, every single time, the referee, he'd stop the game. And he'd say, number 10, come here. And I'd think, oh no, what have I done? I showed no mercy in my slide tackle. And I'd look up at him. And he always smelled of like boiled cabbage and he had really hairy nostrils. And I'd say, yeah. And he'd say, you need to tuck your plait down the back of your shirt and stop using it like a weapon. <laughs> Apparently I was turning my head and flicking all the boys in the eye. Yes! So I had to retire from football because I was in fact a ninja. And I did eventually follow in my parents' footsteps and I turned to the sport of rowing. I ended up rowing for Great Britain for a number of years and I had this huge dream. It was a, a dream I'd had ever since I was a kid that I wanted to be an Olympian, just like my parents. And the thing was is that I'd had that dream since I was nine years old and I'd gone on and I'd gone on and I hadn't actually stopped to question whether, because it was something I'd wanted since I was a kid, whether it was something I actually wanted to be doing anymore. And at 23, I'd fallen completely out of love with the sport, so I decided that I would give up on my Olympic dream and set out on a life of adventure. Now, at this point, I actually read Mark Beaumont's book. So I read Mark's book, and it blew my mind because I didn't realise there was a way that you could travel the world that wasn't in buses and that wasn't on tours, but in fact, that you could go and do it under human power and that you could just throw all your stuff on your bike or on your back and head off into the unknown. So I took the logical step with no experience in any form of cycling, I bought a beautiful pink bike called Boudica, and I saddled up and I went and rode 11,000 miles through every single state of America. Have you got any Americans in the audience? No. Yes, where are you from? California. California, okay, that's fine. You're all right, you've got quite a long time there. Uh, where are you from in the middle, sir? There was an... New York. New York, oh, I went through you twice. That's fantastic. So I have to apologize if anyone was from Idaho or Kentucky. I mean, it was literally about half an hour in those states. But I want to tell you about the most inspirational person that I met on that journey. Now, this is Betty the Hutch Hutchinson. She lives in Manchester, New Hampshire, and every single year she enters the Manchester five-kilometer running race, and she tries to break the record for the 90 to 99 years old age group. Now, at 93 years of age, she, every single morning, she uses... She's got this little house in the woods, and there's a mailbox a mile away at the end of her driveway, and she uses that as her training run every single day. So I went through New Hampshire on my bike, and I got the pleasure of staying with Betty and her family. And I thought, right, well, I'm going to go on this training run. Now, the ritual, it starts at about half six in the morning. So I'm, I'm looking up at the stairs, and I see Betty. She's, like, negotiating her way down. She's holding onto the banister. And then she shuffles over to the front door where she's got these two essential items of clothing. They're laid out on this pew. And she picks up the first one. It's this yellow scarf, and she wraps it round once, twice. And she shuffles sideways. She starts giving me the eye a bit. And then she picks up this matching yellow beanie, and she pulls it down over her brow, and I can see it says, Hutch, on it. All right, right. Then she, she disappears. She starts shuffling off into the kitchen. She's cramming in boiled eggs. I'm like, Betty's on the protein. Like, this is serious stuff. So anyway, the door flings open, oh, and it's such a nice day. You know, the birds are singing, the sky's blue. And so I just start chatting away. You know, I love a bit of a chat. There is no chatting allowed on Betty's training run. So we carry on in silence. 
And this driveway, it, it winds a little bit and it undulates. And we get to the first little corner. And Betty, she looks sideways at me and she breaks the silence for the first time. And she just says, I like to cut the corners. And poof, she shoots across my path. I'm like, all right, eggs are kicking in, are they, Betty, love? And then we get to the end of the driveway and there's this final little hill and there's a mailbox at the end of it and she can see it and I know she's seen it. And she just looks sideways at me again. She breaks the silence, second only time, and she just says, I'm going for the finish. And poof, she's gone. All I've got is like 93-year-old dust in my face. Now, what I love about Betty is that I know for a fact that all her family say to her, Betty, you're, you're a little bit crazy, but we love you for it. And all the doctors say to her, Betty, love, you know, take it easy. What are you doing? But every single year, she goes out and she runs that 5K and she does it surrounded by her 19 grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And as they run past men in their 40s and their 50s with Betty, like, powering on in the middle, the grandchildren, they turn around and they go, Dude, you just got beaten by my grandma! Does anyone want to be like Betty when they grow up? Yes, I do. Boys, we can make that happen. That's totally possible now. So now, unlike Betty, I, as I said, I am not a natural runner, not just my freakishly long arms, but I sometimes, I don't feel great when I go running. So runners, how do you feel when you go on a run? Sally, how do you feel when you go on a run? Sally, Sally's name is Sally Orange, and she has done seven marathons on seven continents dressed as seven different pieces of fruit. <laughs> how do you feel when you go running? Sick. Sally feels sick. Anyone else, how do you feel when you run? How do you feel? Yeah. You feel good. I love it. Anyone else feel good? Yeah, you feel good. Free, ageless, all of these words. Now, I'll level with you. When I run, I feel like a sausage. Sometimes a Cumberland sausage, sometimes a Lincolnshire sausage, but definitely a sausage. And even if you're a runner, you know, you have those days where you head out the door and you just feel like... <sighs> You know, completely unbuilt for purpose. But there is something amazing about running. You know, just grabbing your trainers and heading out the door with nothing to think about except the trail. And so inspired by Betty, I started to think about other things that I could do. I thought, well, Betty gets out there and she pushes it every day. So what can I do that I haven't done before? And I thought, well, maybe I can do a running journey. You know, maybe that's something I do. And then I thought, no, running journeys aren't for me. Therefore, the girls you see on the front of the magazines with the abs and the ponytail swishing along, you know, they're for real adventurers. I thought, well, let's test out this theory. Let's test out whether I am, in fact, a runner. And so I was scrolling through the internet, and I came across a marketing video. Now, marketeers have a lot to answer for. So in this particular marketing video, there are people running through poppy fields and there's this euphoric dance music playing and everyone's bobbing along. And I watch them and they're running through like this, oh, with their hands in their poppies like this. And I thought, I want to run through with my hands in the poppies. So I entered a 60 mile running race. Logical, right? Now I thought, because it's a 60 mile running race, I'm going to have to train. Like absolutely, there's no way I can't train. I will definitely train for this race because I've entered it. Three weeks before the race, I have done no training, uh, and I'm faced with what I should do at this point. What would you do? Who, hands up, if you would pull out, sack it off, go for the pub, hands up. Who would do that? Yeah? Okay, a lot of you are lying. Um, who, who would just go for it? Yeah, stuff it, have it, excellent. Right, a couple of you, and the rest of you, I don't know what you do, you'd be on another planet, excellent. Right, so I thought, I am going to punish myself for not training for this race by going through with it. So, I mean, the result was I ate far too much malt loaf and I forgot to cut my toenails. So by the end of it, I had eight of my toenails hanging off and I kept throwing up the malt loaf and it was one of these really hot July days. And on this particular July day, it got so hot that then the skies cracked and we had this freak hailstorm. So I'm running past people on the floor. They're crouched down with their hands over their head. There's golf ball-sized hailstones raining down. Their knuckles are bleeding. I'm running past with these fountains of malt loaf vomit, thinking, I can't save myself. <laughs> Complete disaster. But I managed it. it. Took me 13 hours and 40, minute, 40 minutes. And I got to the end, and I wound up in so much pain that I actually woke up the following morning, and I wrote myself an email. I said, Dear Anna, Never do anything that stupid ever again. 
Love you, send. Still got that email. But I had made it through that race, and I thought, well, hang on, if, if you can make it through that race, and there's got to be something going on up here that says I can do a running journey. And I have this theory that I like to live my life by, and it's the way I approach any challenge. It's a very scientific diagram. I've been working a long time with Bristol University on it, and it is the bonkers to possible scale, okay? So when you've got an idea for a challenge that you'd like to do, I mean, if it's this end, does everyone remember the story about the time it all went to plan? No, that is a terrible story, absolutely terrible story. So what you want to do is you want to slide it along just so it's close enough to the bonkers, but not quite so it tips off into the ridiculous, and stop there. That is your challenge that you should be taking on, incredibly scientific. So I started thinking, right, I can definitely do a long-distance running journey, and then I read this book called Born to Run. Any of you runners read this book? Yes, you have. Do you know, does anyone know the name of this tribe? Tara Humara, you come and see me at the end, I've got a prize for you. Fantastic. Round of applause for that woman there. <laughs> this is the Tara Humara Indian tribe, and they live in the Copper Canyon in Mexico. And in 48 hours, they can run 435 miles. That is just, you know, that is just no big deal to them. Actually, it is someone's birthday in the tribe. That's why they run that fast. Special occasion. But routinely... You've got men, women, children, grannies like Betty. They will go out and they will run 250 miles non-stop. Popping down the shops for some milk, no big deal. So I looked at their bodies and, and I looked at all of ours and I thought, well, you know, aside from some fashion choices they got going on there, <laughs> really we're not that different. You know, they've not got extra arms and extra legs. And so if they're capable of running those distances, then there has to be something going on in here that says we're capable of doing that too. Then I realized something really scary. I realized that if I was being completely honest with myself, the only reason that I wasn't going to go and do this long distance running adventure that I really wanted to do was because I was absolutely terrified of what happened if I didn't make it. You know, what happens if you put it all over social media, you tell your friends, you tell your family, and then I get injured before the start line, or I actually get out there and I don't enjoy it and I want to come home. You know, what happens then? And I realized that I was so terrified that I couldn't make the end of this thing, that I couldn't even bring myself to start it. And I think we all hit these points in our lives where you've got two pathways you can take. You've got that way which is the possible and it's you know you can do it there's this comfort of assured success you know in your heart of hearts that you can do it and then there's this way where you can take a little dance with failure which way are we going dancing yes we're going dancing right so I decided that I would find this trail it was a country I really wanted to explore New Zealand and there's this trail called the Tiaroa Trail and it runs for around about 3,000 kilometers 2,000 miles right from the very southern tip all the way to the north. And because it's a trail, I can't actually do this run with like a, a buggy or a cart, as lots of long distance runners do. I was actually gonna have to run it with all my stuff on my back. Simple, logical. So the first phase of that is to actually just put everything out on the floor, put it in a neat little square, very important step for an adventurer, then put it on Instagram, very important. And I weighed it out, and it actually weighed about seven and a half kilos. And I thought, do you know what? This thing was going to take, it was 72 marathons. It was going to take me around about five and a half months. And I thought, seven and a half kilos? That's not too bad, is it? I can cope with that. I can run with seven and a half kilos on my back. And then I put a few more things in. You know, a couple of extra bits, like a little GoPro, a little Kindle, because nights in the tent might get a bit bored, a little iPad mini. But I didn't weigh it, because I thought, well... You know, why did it just be a little bit extra? Seven, seven and a half, roughly. I mean, the reality was it actually ended up looking like this. <laughs> Chocolate, very important, not taking into account the weight ratio. Now, for some reason, halfway through my trip, I was going on this seven and a half kilo mission. So I was running along the trail and I'd bump into people and they'd stop me and they'd say, oh, Anna, you crazy British bird, like you're running this trail. You know, uh, how big's your backpack? And I'd go, oh seven and a half kilos, and they go, really, that's not too bad. I say, yeah, thanks, not too bad, is it? Off I'd run, little cloud of smug around me. Now, for some reason, halfway through this trip, three months into my journey, I stayed with someone that, I said my backpack's seven and a half kilos, and he looked at me and went, mm-hmm. 
And so when I went up for a shower, he snuck into my room and he stole my backpack. I felt violated. I came down the stairs and this big northern guy was stood at the bottom called Paul. He said, Anna. I said, yeah, yeah, Paul. He said, do you want to know how much your backpack weighs? And I said, sorry, northern people in the audience, sorry. And I said, oh, Paul, please, no, don't tell me, no. Too late. And my backpack that I thought was kind of like seven, seven and a half kilos, you know, seven bags of sugar, was actually apparently 14 kilos. And that meant that where there were sections of trail where I was running for up to seven days with food in there, with a kilo of food a day, it was actually up at 20 kilos on my back. But this information did not help me on my run. So the moral of that story is, if like me, you know, if you freak yourself out with all these facts, then just tell yourself lies. It will be absolutely fine. Now, I had done my training for the Tiaroa Trail on the treacherous River Thames towpath. I'm talking about the bit between Hampton Court and Hammersmith. You know, sometimes it floods around barns. And it was not actually to prepare me for what was to come. And I was completely out of my depth. I don't know if you can see the trail on that picture there. Good luck if you can. And most of the time, it looked like this or perhaps like this. Now, my navigational skills at this point extended as far as being able to get across Richmond Park without hitting any deer. So I was completely in, out of my depth and way in over my head. And the other thing is, most of the time, I was actually on my own. So it was just me and my stuffed toy called Kiwi Kev, hanging out in our tent each night. But I started to discover that there were all these unexpected joys to being on your own in the wilderness, in the middle of nowhere. There's only four and a half million people that live in the entire stretch of New Zealand, and the trail mostly went through where everyone wasn't. So this particular ridgeline, I remember this picture vividly because I stood up here, and you know that expression, dance like nobody's watching? Well, I stood up, and this little song came on my iPod. You know that outcast, like, hey, uh, that one, voice of an angel, I know. Well, it came on. You know what the chorus of that song is? I stood on that ridge line, and I shook it. I shook it like a polar picture. And then it finished, and I was like, right, OK, and I ran off. Now, the thing about the trail going through the middle of nowhere is that it goes through some incredible scenery. So this is Lake Pukaki, one of the great lakes in the Southern Island, and you've got Mount Cook there at the background. And I was running up and over the Tongariro Crossing up there in the left, which is a tourist hotspot. But yet I was up there completely by myself with no one and nothing, and there was this amazing peach and scarlet sunset going on. And, and then I was running along stretches of deserted, sandy beach, completely barefoot. I was going up mountains around the edge of Queenstown. And I actually started to realise that being on my own in the wilderness wasn't such a bad thing after all. Now, there were some things to distract me along the way. I started bumping into people. And I would run into people. And when I would run into them and go into the towns, it was quite often, actually, the people I met in the towns that would spur me on. So I decided, before I left for the journey that I was going to go into schools and I was going to speak to kids because I wanted to say to them, do you know what, kids? I didn't know if I could do this. I've still got no idea whether I'm going to make the end, but I'm damn well willing to give it a crack. And I wanted to tell the kids that. Now, when I'd run out of town, they'd often pack me off with little projects, which wasn't great for my backpack weight, but they would, they would write me little letters. And I want to just share with you two of my favourite letters for the kids. Okay, this is the first one. It's read by uh, Wilson. Wilson wrote this. He says... Anna McNuff is tall and proud and trying to raise money for kids. She has a goal to run from the bottom of New Zealand to the top. She has blonde hair and blue eyes, and she's very, very fit and strong like a boy has abs. <laughs> Hear that? It's official. <laughs> this is the second one. Okay, this is uh, by Charlotte. She's age seven as well. She says, Anna McNuff is as brave as a half-terrifying wolf, half-fire-breathing dragon. She runs as fast as a Lamborghini. That is not true. She would be as tired as a sleepy bear. That is true. She has blonde hair, blue eyes, and it is short, the hair like my eyelashes. <laughs> now, it wasn't until I got actually into the, the very southern tip of the North Island that I experienced something that is quite a danger to a lot of adventurers, and that is kind napping. Now, I don't know if anyone's been kind napped before. Grannies are really good at it. Mums are really good at it. You know, when they force feed you and won't let you leave. But I was kind napped by these two souls. So 
They run a, an outdoor centre in the North Island of New Zealand. And as I ran in, I said to them, right, I'm just going to stay one night, if that's okay. Their names are Sally and John. Now, they're both ex-military, but Sally is a complete like, femme fatale. And she tries to put you off by wearing pearls. Don't be swayed by the pearls. And I ran in. I said, okay, thanks, guys. I'm just going to stay one night, and then I'll, then I'll head off. And she said, okay, okay. And then I woke up the next morning, and Sally came in with her pearls, and she said... Oh, Anna, I mean, you could leave, but Sam really wants you to stay. And I was like, oh, Sam. Okay, if Sam wants me to stay, I'll, I'll stay. And then I got up the next morning. I said, right, Sally, I'm marching into the kitchen. I said, Sally, oh, I've got to run out today. I'm leaving. Bye, Sam. Bye, Sally. Bye, Sir John. She said, Anna, I mean, mm, you can leave today, but um, we've kind of invited the whole neighborhood around for dinner, so it'd be a bit rude if you didn't turn up. I was like, mm. and at this point, I was 30 years old, and I was thinking, you've got to stand up to this woman, Anna, for goodness sakes. And the next day, I go into the kitchen, and I said, Sally, I'm, I'm, thanks so much for, you know, Sam and the, the dinner, but I'm, I'm going tonight. And she said, well, you can leave tomorrow, Anna, but we've made pavlova. <sighs> Special pavlova. I was like, fine, fourth day, go into the kitchen. I'm Sally, I am leaving tomorrow. She said, well, you can leave tomorrow, Anna, but if you stay... We're going to go on the flying fox in the back garden. Some back garden, isn't it? Now, it wasn't until I got there on the fourth day that Sally finally cracked. And she admitted to me that she used beer as a weapon. So she said what would happen is that she would come out to the end of her garden and she would watch, watch the hikers come around the bottom of her land and she'd spot them. Then she'd run to the kitchen, she'd grab a crate of beer and she'd go out and she'd just dangle it at them. And I said, Sally, your nails. Like, that's, that's pretty clever. I said, have you ever had any tricky customers? She said, yeah. There was this one Japanese guy. And I said, what was his deal? And she said, well, I saw him come in, so I ran and grabbed the beer and I went out and I dangled. And then she said, he said, No. She said, why not? I said, I must hike for 16 hours every day. And she said, okay, I'm just going to leave the beer by the side of the trail and go back in the kitchen. She said she watched through the kitchen window as this guy hiked up and down around the beer for 40 minutes and then stopped and went, yes. <laughs> and the final story I want to tell you is about the worst day I had on the trail because... I think that's when you learn the most about yourself. You know, in those really, really dark moments where you think, like, you can't go on, that is when you learn what you're really made of. And this particular section, so I had to go down this place called the Deception Valley. And my trail notes said that I was going to have to cross a river 30 times. Now, I'm from Kingston-upon-Thames, okay? We build bridges over our rivers. In New Zealand, they just tr plough the trail straight through the raging torrents. And I was getting increasingly frightened about these river crossings. So I started to get into this little routine. I'd shuffle up to the river's edge, and I would unclip my backpack in case it got swept away, and I didn't want to get pinned under a rock or anything. And I'd take off my GPS tracker that was onto my backpack, and I would put it on my sports bra. And then I'd take this deep breath, and then into the river I'd go. Now, sometimes we're talking like the river is maybe up to my ankle, or my, my, my shin, maybe my mid-thigh. But then there were other times where I was in the middle of nowhere, miles from anyone, and I'm in the river right up to my chest, and I'm carrying my backpack over my head. And my mind is just doing somersaults. And I started to think about all the things that could possibly go wrong, all that morbid daydreaming that goes on. And I wasn't paying any attention, and I stepped out of the river on crossing number 17. I was counting them off, and I put my foot on this rock, and my ankle gave way with this really loud crack. I wasn't concentrating, I just stepped off a rock and slipped. Please be okay. I hate this section. It's absolute. Try and move. Thanks for the laugh and support there, guys. Really hurt. 
So I, I did try and move. And at first I thought, oh, this is totally fine. I can do this. I got up and I put some weight on my left ankle, no problem. Put some weight on my right ankle and then it just gave way again. And so it took me about four hours for me to hobble to a place where it was flat enough to pitch up my tent. And I crawled in at that point, looked at what was by then just a complete ballooning mess of an ankle. And I just, I just cried my eyes out. I just sobbed my heart out. And I thought, right, well, I'm not going to make a decision about this right now. So I will go to sleep and I will work this out in the morning. Now, in the morning, I remembered something. You know, I thought maybe in running what was the entire length of New Zealand, 72 trail marathons, I thought, I'm probably going to have the odd day where I'm not going to want to get out of my tent. You know, I'm probably going to have a day where I just want to curl up in a ball and actually just cry. So I had, in fact, I had packed myself a secret weapon. I had packed myself these. Woo! That is a... U yeah, we can have a round of applause for pants. That is a unicorn having a fight with a robot under a rainbow. Now, I think... I'm going to get down now. I think it's scientifically impossible to be unhappy when you're wearing these pants. Point one. Point two is that I put them in my backpack because, you know, they remind me, we are so lucky. You know, I am so lucky. All of us are. We've got the freedom and the opportunity to go and do these crazy challenges and we do it by choice. And so I call these my pants of perspective. So I pulled on my pants of perspective in the middle of the bush, which I don't know if you can see, but the ankle strapping quite nicely complements the rainbow there. And I pushed on all the way to the very tip of New Zealand, 1,911 miles. And I'd gone to schools and spoken to around about 4,000 Kiwi kids along the way. Now, there's always going to be those points where you set yourself these huge, ridiculous challenges and you start being filled with all this fear of what happens if you don't make it. And then you get all this ugly self-doubt and all these emotions start bubbling to the surface. But all I would say is get yourself a pair of magic pants and get it in perspective. This is what I look like at the finish line. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> I'm at the lighthouse! <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> oh, love is love. <laughs> Sugar balls. But that is it! 1,911 miles from Bluff to Cape Rianga. 52 kilometres today. And I've made it. I've bloody made it. Oh my god. <laughs> the hardest thing I've ever done in my life and this is beautiful 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 sign <laughs> London only 18,029 kilometers away <laughs> maybe I'll run there <sighs> thank you Thanks a lot. Can everyone hear? Yeah. Thanks a lot, Anna. That was very uh, inspirational. I do want these pants, actually. Any different colours? They go well with the shoes, actually. I was just thinking that. Yeah. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it. <laughs> um, has anyone got any questions for Anna? This was part of an early strategy, so I googled amazing leggings, uh, and it was because I was having to get out of bed at about half four in the morning to do some training runs, and I thought, what is going to get me out of bed? So I have an array of them, and this was my favourite pair. I think they come from China. <laughs> Any other questions? S simply, what next? 
Um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm starting, there's a run, I'm going to do a running adventure next summer, but in the meantime, my other half does the same thing as me, his name's Jamie, and uh, he's currently running 230 marathons across America dressed as a superhero, because that's what adults do. Uh, so I'm actually spending the next year kind of being a bit of home base and going out there, hitching a ride out of town, trying to track him down, run with him for a bit and come back. So I'll be in America lots, running weekly stints for the next year. Any other questions? Did you do any set survival training or any kind of training to prepare you for the wilds of New Zealand? No, and I, <laughs> I, was, I should have sugarcoated that one. No, and I would not recommend that, I have to say. And I was almost quite embarrassed. So I wrote a book about this trip, and I was quite embarrassed writing the book at how naive I was. I honestly, and you're going to think I'm a bim, but I, I thought it was just going to be like the South Downs way. I honestly, I thought, I thought, because it's a trail and there's a website, and the website is brilliant, I thought it will be signposted, you know, I'll just be able to, I didn't even take a GPS with me. And then a week in, I realised that I could just about read a map, but I had quite often no idea how far I was from, from things on the map because I couldn't really work out where I'd run because I was in dense bush. So, um, no, I didn't, but I learned very quickly. And, um, and within the first few weeks, I was sort of trying to gather as much information as possible to stay safe. So I was trying not to be reckless, but I did start a bit naive. And I think that comes from living in Britain, <laughs> in, in, in London anyway. So I saw a picture of your ankle. Yes. How did you manage to walk on your ankle with, when it was swollen? I mean, did you, you didn't have ice out there, so I'm just wondering how you <laughs> managed. No, there's no ice, but there's very cold rivers. So um, what, what I did was, I, I, that next day after I busted my ankle, I strapped it up to the point where I almost removed the blood circulation from it, but it didn't move at all. And then I just thought, if I can make it even just one mile, two miles, three miles forward, then I will worry about the mile after that as we go. And so that's what I did. I walked 13 miles the next day, looking down at my ankle, which gave me a really sore neck and tendonitis in my other foot. <laughs> um, and then I made it to this hut, the hut you saw where I was wearing the pants perspective. And I thought, right, I'll wake up in the morning and if I feel all right, then I'll start hobbling on the next day. And then I kept the ankle strapped up for about six weeks, just icing it in rivers. And eventually I was able to take the strapping off right at the end. But yeah, it was um, yeah, it was a bit gnarly, but survived. Thank you.